welcome to Sci-Fi Frontier. I'm Dominic. And in this video, I'm going to be talking about the documentary, What We Left Behind, looking back at Star Trek Deep Space Nine. So this is a documentary I didn't know existed. I just stumbled upon it on Tubi last night and saw it was a Star Trek documentary. So I watched it immediately. And uh, overall, it's a really good documentary. If you're a Star Trek fan, or, and especially if you're a Deep Space Nine, Nine fan, this is a must watch. And this was created by uh, Ira Stephen Bear, and he crowdfunded this documentary. So uh, now I'm going to get into, now I gave my overall thoughts of the doc, that's my overall thoughts of the documentary. But uh, now I'm going to kind of get into the more nitty gritty of what things I liked or what I didn't like. So what I really liked is all the behind the scenes stuff and all the behind the scenes drama that they, that they kind of got into, but a lot of it they glossed over. So like uh, how certain actors were resistant to certain storylines, uh, how certain contract negotiations didn't go so well for certain actors, all that stuff I found totally fascinating. And then uh, kind of like how it commented on certain things like on war and then certain social issues and things like that. All that stuff was interesting. And uh, so the other thing that was interesting was uh, them talking about early fan reactions, reading the fan mail and how fans reacted to the series initially, things like that, and some of the pushback from fans initially. So that was interesting as well. Uh, now, now the, 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 co the documentary kind of goes back and forth between two things. It goes back and forth between that and then this other thing where the right, old writers all get together and they pitch a theoretical season eight season premiere episode. So they get together and say, okay, what would we do if we were to bring back Deep Space Nine now for season eight? And it's been 20 years. And where are these characters going to be at? And what would, we, what would we do for that? And so they kind of pitch this idea. And the story, I will admit, it, it's an interesting story. But this, to me, honestly, was the least interesting part of the documentary. And it's something I would have, could have done without. It uh, Every time they went to that, it just went on too long. And I thought it was boring. And I wanted to get back to the behind the scenes stuff. So that was the weakest part of the documentary. And I'd rather they have, because even though the idea was cool, what they were talking about, like they're not going to do it. So to me, it seemed pointless. If this was a show they were actually going to do this, then I would get excited, but they're not. Um, so to me, I would rather have seen that time devoted to more like behind the scenes stuff. Uh, more of what the other part of the documentary is. And uh, so now, just, uh, it was interesting that early fan reactions... Now, one thing they didn't really talk about, and it's something I've heard... Now, I've heard that a lot from other Star Trek fans, that Deep Space Nine is too dark. I mean, I've heard that go back... That goes back years... That goes way back years back. And But the other thing I've heard a lot of people who don't like Deep Space Nine talk about is they didn't like the religious aspect of it. They thought it was too religious. I always thought that was interesting because it's fate. It's not like a real religion. It's the Bajoran religion. So I always thought that was kind of an odd thing to comment on. Now, what I thought of the series is, uh, and my reaction to it was, well, first off, every Star Trek series that has ever come out, I was always excited for. Um, when the first time I heard about Star Trek The Next Generation, I was really excited to see that series. And I was really excited for it. When I started watching it, the only thing I was skeptical of in the beginning was Captain Picard, because he was so different from Kirk. I was like, I don't know about this guy and all that, because like Kirk was like the man to me when I was a kid. But... It didn't take long for the character to win me over, and he's now one of my favorite characters, uh, Captain Picard. And uh, now, same thing with Deep Space Nine came out. I was really excited to watch that because that was the first Star Trek show that had nothing to do with the Enterprise. And that's what I thought, that's what was really fascinating about the show. I said, well, this is a new show. It's going to be on a space station, and it has nothing to do with the USS Enterprise. And at that point, it was kind of like you couldn't think of a Star Trek show that didn't take place on the bridge of the Enterprise. Like... In my mind, back then, the most logical next show would have been like another show of another crew that took place further in the future on another Enterprise. But uh, so this was really caught my interest. So I was really excited to see it. Now, when I started watching it, that first pilot I thought was really good. It was interesting when I saw it. And uh, but once I got into the series itself, I found the first couple seasons boring, to be honest. I mean, there's a few good episodes in there, but I thought it was very boring. Like, there was nothing really happening, anything like that. It wasn't until, like, season three that things really got kicked off. Basically, when the Defiant, when they get the Defiant, that's when things kick off. Uh, so, but I've always been excited for every show. 
Same thing with uh, Voyager, Enterprise, and even Discovery and Picard. All I've been excited for all of them, and it's until uh, once I I give them all a chance. Once I get in through the first season, then I kind of make my judgment after that whether I like them or not. Now, what's interesting though is a lot of defenders of current Star Trek who uh, as, who say that the, the the criticism of the show is being too dark is not fair because they say, well, Deep Space Nine was too dark, and you like that. That was too dark. That was Dark Trek as well. Now, to me, the difference between the two is, yes, Deep Space Nine was dark, but it was much better written than current Star Trek. I think the fact that the current Star Trek is like Discovery and Picard, they're not written very well as compared to the Star Trek of the 90s, uh, like Deep Space Nine and stuff like that. Like, I think Deep Space Nine is a much better written show than Star Trek Discovery or Star Trek Picard. So there's that difference. And the difference between the two, I think, is, yes, Deep Space Nine was dark, but it was still had that silver lining of hopefulness through the series, where I find the new Star Trek is written in a way that it's, like, you kind of get the feeling that it's very, the writers are very nihilistic. It has this nihilistic feel to it. And that's the thing that I think it separates the two. And that's just my opinion, but that's how I feel. Now, what I thought, now they talked about how Deep Space Nine kind of struggled. Now, the thing, you know, because uh, I've seen all these shows like Air and stuff in the 90s. I'm old enough for that. Now, at the time, my, my thing was that there was like too much Trek at the one time. You had Star Trek The Next Generation that was, you know, still on air, was still going when... Uh, Deep Space Nine first aired and then when that went off the air they immediately went into doing the next generation films and then after that you had Star Trek Voyager start up and so all that kind of like pushed Deep Space Nine down it kind of like you know you're they're all all these shows are like fighting for air against each other kind of thing and I think it would have uh, I think it would have came off much better if Deep Space Nine was on its own like it aired after Next Generation ended and it didn't have to compete with another series. Like, he probably still could have done TNG movies, but it didn't have to compete with another series, another Star Trek series like Star Trek Voyager. Uh, so that's one thing I thought that uh, kind of hurt the show, if anything, when the show originally aired. So now I'm going to get into some things about the series that kind of irritated me. One, I'm going to go back and forth between things I like and things that, that, that irritated me in the series. So one of the things in this documentary, when they said it, it really irritated me, is they kind of took credit for something I don't think they deserve credit for. And that's, they said that, uh, I think it was season three, they wanted to do a three episode, a three-parter. And that had never been done in Star Trek before. And there was actually a lot of resistance from the studio because they said, well, it's syndicated television and they, it needs to be episodic. Because if you make it long story form or long story arcs, then people who tune in for an episode will be confused and don't know where they're at and things like that. But uh, they got their way, and then Deep Space Nine went on to be more kind of longer story arcs where you had story arcs that would go on for three or four episodes. And they kind of took credit, well, then they, that almost implying that they pioneered that because then other shows went on to do like do that, like Battlestar Galactica and in the 2000s, and then Game of Thrones, and then this current Star Trek series do, does that. But like they kind of act like they're responsible for that, which actually... For one, that's not new in television at all. Uh, it might might have been new for science fiction on television, but not for television as a whole because he had shows like Dallas and stuff, and that was like very that that was like that wasn't episodic. That was like a continuous storyline that went on week after week. It was like a long story arc. And uh, as far as science fiction goes, Babylon Five was really the one that started that. And if you want to even go further back as far as science fiction go, Robotech did that too, like where it had like these long story arcs where it was more like a soap opera than episodic. And uh, D5 started that right with season one and because it came out the same time as Deep Space Nine. Roughly the same time. So to me, I don't really think that kind of irritated me when they said that. I don't really think they deserve credit for that. Uh, now, the other thing that... Now, this is something that didn't bother me. Uh, when it came up, uh, I wasn't surprised because this isn't like everything now. Uh, everything is so politicized. But they do take some political shots in this documentary. Uh, it does get political in around like the middle part of the documentary. So depending on which way you lean, if you lean right, this is going to irritate you and get under your skin. If you lean pretty left, it uh, you'll probably 
applaud it maybe i don't know depending on where you land on the political spectrum this is gonna either you're either gonna like this or dislike this so it's kind of like a divisive moment in the documentary but they take uh you know some shots at donald trump they don't mention his name but they show some clips with him and basically um it gets political kind of thing talking about how how they haven't really a well, you know, I, I won't get into it, but you, kinda, you can you can kind of guess what they go on with. But it doesn't last long. So it didn't bother me. I didn't care for it because I wasn't surprised because everything is so politicized now. But depending on which way you lean, left or right, just so you know, it's there. It's there. But it's not. It doesn't take up a lot of time in the documentary, but it is in there just as a heads up. Now, the other thing they talk about is what I thought was interesting is Worf coming on the show. That was an interesting thing and how some of the actors reacted to that was interesting, like uh the actor that played Quark, he was kind of mad about it because he's he said well you know this kind of they kind of felt like we couldn't do it on our own that we needed help with the series the series couldn't stand it on on its own and then the ac actor that played Kira Norris Nana Visitor she felt kind of threatened by it because she thought she was like the number her the the main the, the, the first officer of the show so she felt like if Worf came on there he was going to take her place and push her character into the background and uh and then some other cast members were really excited, like, wow, we got this character, let's see what we can do with him, and stuff like that. Now, I think uh, this uh, move of bringing Worf on Deep Space Nine did, did a lot, made Deep Space Nine more interesting, but it, it did wonders for the character of Worf. They really developed the character of Worf on Deep Space Nine way more than they ever did on TNG. So that's, I think that's a good thing. And... Uh, now, the one thing about the documentary is there are certain topics that there seem to be more to the story that I wish they had gotten into. One is uh, the death of Jadzia Dax and why that happened. And they killed the character off because of contract negotiations with the actress that played the character. She uh, uh, felt like she wasn't getting her fair pay. And uh, they they basically told her, like, take, what, take this if take this or leave it. If it wasn't for the show, you would be working at Walmart. And then they decide, okay, well, we're not going to, we're not going to, you know, give her a pay raise. We're just going to kill her character off. And, but I kind of felt like there was like more to that story. That was a very interesting story that you could have gotten a lot deeper into. And uh, another interesting thing was Garrick being gay, the character of Garrick. So in the documentary, they imply that they were planning on making Garrick gay, but they didn't now but they don't go really into why they didn't do it and uh, now i heard some stories going around that they had planned to make garrick a gay character and have him want and have him pursue dr Bashir, but it was actually rick berman that squashed the whole idea and uh, said like no we're not going to do this uh so but they didn't talk about that part of it because rick berman's actually in the documentary so they don't really do anything in there to throw rick berman under the bus so they kind of gloss over that uh, now, the other thing that I thought was really interesting is there was a storyline they were going to pursue where Kara and Gul Dukat would have had a love affair, but uh, Nana Visitor says she completely resists that storyline. She wanted nothing to do with it because she felt it would damage the character of Kara Norris, which um, I don't know who knows how that could have played out. I mean, it's hard to say at this point because uh, what's done is done. But what was interesting is she was... She said if it was anyone else but, but she says, she doesn't say Gul Dukat, she says the actual actor's names, like she slips. And then she goes, oh, no, no, I didn't mean that. I meant the character Gul Dukat. So is it, was it really for the character or is it just she couldn't stand the actor? <laughs> I wonder. And then they switch over to the actor who played Gul Dukat and his reaction. He was all for it, he said in the storyline. And he openly admits that he had a thing for the actor, actress, Nana Visitor, and that's why he was all for it. So that, I thought that was pretty amusing and interesting. And uh, another thing I thought was kind of cool was uh, Kara was talking about when she read for, or not Kara, but Nana Visitor, when she read for the character of Kara, she liked the character because anyone could have played the character the way the character read. It didn't read as a female character. And um, so, and that's something I think that's kind of like missing in a lot of writing today. There's a lot of writing today that kind of put the character first, or the character's identity first. So, okay, we have to have a gay character, so let's write him as gay, and then it's like, everything go, kind of goes around that so what you get is these almost like stereotype characters like uh like the gay character on discovery uh the botanist character when i was watching discovery and he first comes on 
right away you know he's the gay guy because of how he acts. He acts very effeminate and flamboyant. He acts the way that, I don't know, straight people think gay people are in their minds. Um, now, to be fair, I have I do know gay people that are like him, uh, do act that way, but I also have met a lot of straight guys that act like he does too, that are very flamboyant and effeminate. And if they didn't come out and tell you they were straight, you would never, you would think they were gay. Um, so so it, it's just this weird thing where I think, I don't know, it was, they, they did it better characters back in the day where they, where you create a really good character first and then you, then that character that could work anyway, and then you tack on whatever identity you want after where I think, uh, if you want to compare the two, I think Bordis on the Orville is a way better gay character than I think the character's name is Stamets on Star Trek Discovery. Uh, because Bordis is just such a good character, but just that just happens to be gay. Where Stamets is the token gay character that was put in there because they needed a gay character or they wanted a gay character. You know what I mean? That's what I'm trying to get at. Where I think they should do it the way it was done in Deep Space Nine back in the way they should still be doing characters like that. So I thought that was an interesting thing. Now, there's another thing that they talked about in this documentary I thought was kind of a ridiculous story, and I, I kind of didn't really buy it. It's the whole story behind Cisco's bald head. So, for years, I mean, years upon years, the story behind uh, Avery Brooks' uh, goatee and bald head. The story I always heard, now, before he did Deep Space Nine, he, did, uh, he played a reoccurring character called Hawk on a show called Spencer for Hire. And in that show, he was kind of like a streetwise badass kind of guy. And uh, so he um, he had his goatee and he had his bald head. And then they actually made a spin-off series just of Hawk. And um, I remember seeing a few episodes of that. And I remember seeing the character when he popped up on uh, Spencer for Hire. So the story I always heard that when he came in to play uh, Cisco, they wanted him to visually look different from uh, the character of Hawk because he had just come off that show. And they didn't want people to just see Hawk when he first came in. So when he shows up on the space station, people just look, oh, well, that's just Hawk. It's Hawk. They wanted to give it some time. So it had cemented in people's minds that he was playing Cisco and get some separation from the Hawk show. And then he went with the bald look and bald goatee look afterwards. Now, in this documentary, they give a different story for it. The reason in the documentary is they, they almost make it like a racist thing. Like the studio said they wanted him to have the get rid of the bald head and the goatee because they didn't want him to look like the thing they say in the documentary is he with the goatee and bald head he looked too street whatever that's supposed to mean i guess ghetto or thuggish maybe that's what they're getting at and they didn't want him to have that look going into the series and as the series went on avery brooks fought to get his bald head and goatee back which eventually they caved in and let him and then even when the actress, the actor that played uh, Miles O'Brien even said, oh, well, you know, they they kind of they knew they were going to get some bush pushback from people that were against the black lead in the show. And so they kind of like Uncle Tommed him, almost like implying that because they gave they because he didn't have a goatee and he had hair, he was almost kind of whitewashed a bit or something. It was a really bizarre explanation and I didn't really buy it. I, I don't know. Maybe it's true, but it just seems like almost like too convoluted of an explanation that doesn't really, to me, hold water. Like, I don't know of anyone who would have thought that back in the 90s, to be honest. And there were a lot of black leads back then. Like, you had Eddie Murphy doing all these movies. You had the Cosby show that was on for years and years. So, like, the idea of a black lead in something, to me, wouldn't have, wasn't a big deal. But, so, but if the story's true, I think that says more about the studio than the audience, to be honest. Because uh, it seems like the studio always assumes the audience is going to be way more racist than what it is. But, I don't know, I think it's, it's almost like kind of like an Occam's razor thing. The most simplest explanation is probably the most, uh, is probably the one. So it's probably the one where they didn't want him to look too much like the Hawk character because people will just see him as Hawk and not Cap or not the new, and not Cisco. So that was really a weird thing in the documentary. Uh, but one, the other thing that I really like though, is they touched upon something. Uh, now they go into some LGBTQ representation in the documentary. They talk about how, uh, they showed the first lesbian kiss between... Uh, I don't think that was the first lesbian kiss. I actually think that was done on Roseanne, but they showed the first, like, two women kissing on TV, the first gay kiss, or one of the first gay kisses, and uh, kind of established that Dax was bisexual because they had that other woman that uh, Curzon was Curzon's former lover, and then she came on, and then her and Dax 
had a kiss or whatever. But there was other episodes that kind of also inferred that Dax was bisexual, like the one where they go on the planet Ryza, and uh, Vanessa Williams guest stars on that one, and then her and uh, Dax are rubbing that weird play thing together, and it's almost kind of like a sexual thing, and then Worf walks in on it, and he's all mad and jealous and walks out. Uh, so there was always, like, that was implied a few more times that uh, Dax was a bisexual character. So then, uh, the, but the other thing, then Ira Bear kind of, like, flogs himself a little bit in this uh, one scene because he goes through a checklist of everything they checked off and then they go to check off the LGBTQ representation and he's oh no we got to take that check out because we didn't do enough we didn't do enough to, re uh, to represent them uh, but uh, now one thing they they didn't touch upon or one opportunity where they could have introduced a gay character is when they killed off Dax I didn't really care for the character that replaced her Ezri Dax because I thought it was like just it was like too much of an off-brand Jadzia Dax Kind of like cornflakes. You got the regular cornflakes, and you got that weird off-brand cornflakes. I didn't really uh, care for that character. If I think they should have just went, if they're gonna do it, just do it and get rid of that character altogether, lock, stock, and barrel, the symbiote, and everything, and introduce a completely new character. And they could have used that opportunity to bring in a brand new Star Trek character and have that be a gay character, an openly gay character, and then that way they could have introduced a gay character that way. So I think that was a missed opportunity uh, of Deep Space Nine. Now, going on to representation, uh, there's always talk about representation when it comes to, um, you know, gay people and trans people and black people and white people and Chinese people, all these things. But one thing that the show gave some representation to that nobody talks about is a single dad. And that's something that they talked about in this documentary and something I really appreciated. It's the thing that really made Cisco a unique character from Kirk and Picard is he was a single father and he had a son. They talk about how Avery Brooks uh, acknowledged that that was a problem in the African-American community where a lot of uh, black kids didn't have father figures. And so he really wanted to make sure that Cisco was a very uh, was a very positive uh, black father figure to his son Jake and talks about how Jake uh, and then the actor Jake talks about how in real life Avery Brooks treated him like a son would take him to basketball games and stuff with his own son and he met all these other basketball, basketball players and introduced him as a son and stuff like that. And it, it was, um, I really liked that part of the, uh, part of the documentary. I thought that was pretty good. And, uh, and I thought that was, uh, really, and that really, uh, shows how cool of a guy Avery Brooks was that he wanted to make sure that was put in there. And, uh, cause one of my favorite episodes of deep space nine is actually when, uh, uh, Cisco loses his father like in time and then flash forwards to the future where Cisco is like an old man but uh, and but he spent his whole life trying to get his father back and then Cisco kept appearing to him here and there but he was like slowly losing him over time I can't remember the name of that episode but I really liked that one I thought that one was really good and um, but yeah so that's I mean there's lots you could go into with this documentary but I guess uh, one final thing I guess I'm I, I want to wrap it up with just my thoughts on Deep Space Nine as a series compared to Star Trek The Next Generation. Now, Star Trek The One Next Generation is one of my favorite Star Trek shows, and I do like it more than Deep Space Nine. But I think one of the things that Deep Space Nine has over Star Trek Next Generation is the, the characters on Next Generation, I've heard this complaint from a lot of people, is like they get along too good and they're almost too perfect. Like they never have a lot of conflict among themselves and they don't really develop as characters. And that's a fault of Star Trek Next Generation, but it's also a fault of the original series. Like at the start of TNG, Picard is pretty much the same guy at the end of the series. Same that Riker, like they're all pretty much the same. Where Deep Space Nine really had some really good story arcs. Where you, there's certain characters that weren't the same at the beginning, well, as, as how they started at the end of it. They did a much better job of that. Like their characters were more humanized i guess more flawed they did a better job of that so that's one thing i think deep space nine did a lot better than star trek the next generation but star trek the next generation definitely was a much more light more hopeful show than deep space nine was but deep space nine was kind of got into the more darker side of star trek but did it a much better in a much better way than current star trek does that's just my opinion so uh yeah so uh, probably rambling on too long here but there's lots to talk about in this documentary it's a very interesting documentary and this could almost be expanded into a whole book about all the stuff that went on behind the scenes uh, but yeah if you're again if you're a fan of star trek definitely check this one out 
So that's everything I got to say in this video. Let me know what you think in the comments section, and I will see you at the next one. Thank you to all of my subscribers, and thank you for watching this video. And if you're new to the channel, like, subscribe, and share. And don't forget to hit the bell icon for notification when new videos are uploaded.